Well, it appears that security in Linux has taken a battering this past week. We now have a WannaCry-like worm in Samba, clickjacking in Android, and Militia subtitles in VLC, Kodi, and Popcorn Time. Wow, what a mess things have been this week. So let's look at each one one at a time and actually go through and work out, are they a serious threat? Because mm, it's been blown out of proportion a little bit. Huh, like the press would never do such a thing, would they? So we have a seven-year-old floor in Samba, which has been called CVE 2017-7494. It sometimes can be so disappointing when you see how long a floor has existed in open source. On the other hand, because it's open source, you can see how long the floor has existed for, versus proprietary code you're kind of relying on a company to say, well, you know, this exploit's been around for so many years, or maybe you just have to make a, a guess. Because you could say with... Um, the WannaCry exploit, which affected SMB version 1, well, SMB version 1 came out in around 1992, so we're we going to say the exploit there existed for the past 25 years. So the seven-year-old flaw can be reliably exploited with just one line of code to execute malicious code, as long as a few conditions are met. These requirements include vulnerable computers that a. make file and printer sharing port 445 reachable on the internet, or local network as well, b configure shares to have write privileges, and c use a known guessable server paths for those files. When those conditions are satisfied, remote attackers can upload any code to their choosing and cause the server to execute it, possibly with unfettered root privileges depending on the vulnerable system. Okay, let's add a little bit more clarification into that because I've read this off a different article. So the way Samba works in Linux, you can have a client or a server. This is a complete contrast to Windows, which devices lean towards being a server regardless of their function. So simply being a client and accessing a remote Samba share is not going to make the system that is a client vulnerable. It relies on the server side, in other words, supplying files to another system, more likely in the context of network attached storage devices, and these are going to be a particularly prominent attack point. So the next point, configure shares to have write privileges. So it is actually attacking the anonymous user. So if you have anonymous user access, which has write privileges, not just read privileges, if you have anonymous read privileges, the exploit will not work. It has to be write privileges. And see the known guessable paths. Well, I think that's kind of a given either way, really. So I'm not going to concentrate on that part. So you have to be supplying Samba shares and allow anonymous write privileges. I think just those two points have kind of reduced the impact of the vulnerability quite drastically. But nonetheless, there are quite a number of Samba-enabled computers exposed on port 445 to the internet. Numbers seem to vary wildly, but there are, was it 477,000 known in Shodan? but the true figure seems to be what we got between 92,000 and about 120,000. So there's a couple of screenshots for the attack. What has happened here is a reverse TCP shell connection. So an attacker could push any commands into a victim's system. Actually, that's a fair point. If you've got anonymous write privileges open to the internet, people could just go and delete your files anyway. There's kind of, there's more basic attacks really than just this code exploit. People don't seem to have mentioned that one, do they? And I've only just thought of that literally the moment as I'm recording this. So people who use Samba should check with their operating system or device provider to see if a fix is available. Those who are unable to patch immediately can work around the vulnerability by adding the line nt pipe support equals no into their Samba configuration file. The next one, cloak and dagger click jacking in Android. It's a bit of a lengthy one, this, but it affects all versions of Android right up to the latest version. So it abuses the system alert window drawn top and the blind accessibility service, which they've nicknamed A11Y. So along with the clickjacking attack, they're also using this invisible grid attack, which allows unconstrained keystroke recording, including passwords, private messages, etc. Yeah, they're just putting this grid across the keyboard and recording the position of key presses. So Google have patched most of the vulnerabilities, however not all. Uh, perhaps worryingly that they can actually get the apps into the App Store with the permissions there. And 
and you've got the advice of be careful what permissions you're actually allowing to applications. But of course, how many users take notice of permissions? Or perhaps how many users even understand what the permissions are asking for? So the malicious subtitles. Now I've got a feeling this probably affected VLC first, but because a lot of other media players use the same components of VLC, it spread across to others, so like Kodi and Popcorn Time. So pretty nasty this one, it was another reverse shell exploit. Now the malicious subtitles in question had actually been uploaded to, I think it was Open Subtitles website. So if you're watching a movie and you download these malicious subtitles, you could open up a backdoor into your system. This was, I think, more a responsible researcher showing it, so it's not just going to be affecting everyone. However, the principles of the attack could be used and abused. So there was a demonstration of it, and I believe the Cody demonstration of it actually kind of shows the attack a little bit better. So I'm not going to play that video, but I'll leave a link to the, all these pages in the video description. So Cody have only just released an update. They will address soon we will release oh yeah, 17.2, which will have the fix this week, and I've seen notification of that yesterday. VLC and popcorntime.sh have already been fixed. So just how bad is Linux security nowadays? Now I was watching a video from Matthew Moore. I agree in principle with what he is saying, that anyone who says Linux cannot be exploited, Linux cannot get malware, is absolutely, oh, do we say lying or just not telling the truth? It is perhaps of lower risk compared to proprietary operating systems, but you may be looking here and thinking, wow, this is absolutely alarming. How can we have all these vulnerabilities in Linux? And you know, it, it makes it look worse than all these other applications. Let me explain a bit more about it, because despite the number there, it's not actually as bad as it looks. So these vulnerabilities have a common vulnerability scoring system, a CVSS score, which ranges between 0 and 10, with 10 being the most severe. This score is made up of certain metrics, and we'll just have a quick look at some of these here. So we've got accessibility. So do you have to attack over a local network, or is it internet accessible? The complexity. Specialist conditions exist, such as a race condition with a narrow window, or a requirement for social engineering methods that would be readily noticed by knowledgeable people. Or, on the other hand, there are no special conditions to access the vulnerability. The authentication. Do you have to be authenticated as an administrator or there's no special requirement at all? So confidentiality and integrity, so is there going to be loss of data due to the exploit? There is quite a lot that goes into scoring an exploit. So the average exploits for the Linux kernel range between about 7 and 8, with a few 9 to 10, a couple of 4 to 5 as well. So what does it look like for, say, Apple? Ooh, ouch. So Apple's vulnerabilities range more on average between 9 and 10. So this average goes back the past year. It'll be the same time range for everything I'm going to look at here. So Apple has more severe vulnerabilities. Windows? We've got quite a lot of 7 to 8s, but also the 9 to 10s are quite high. So that's Windows 10. Now we're going to look at Windows 7. Windows 7. So that is slightly more exploitable than Windows 10. You have more in the range of 9 to 10, but you also have a lot more in the 4 to 5 range. Adobe Flash Player. Ooh, ouch. And that's a proprietary application. And that's like a weekly basis almost. You get a severe exploit for Adobe Flash. Debian Linux. Generally low to medium. Google Android. Oh, that's quite bad as well, isn't it? Image Magic. So this seems to be a bit up and coming this year. So Image Magic is a free open source application used generally on servers and used for the manipulation of images. Quite a lot of mid-range vulnerabilities with it. The point with the averages on the CVSS scores, even if you have 100 vulnerabilities at, say, rating of 7 to 8, it is far more damaging to have a singular vulnerability rated at 9 to 10 because the 10 out of 10 vulnerabilities are going to be remotely exploitable, you're going to get deep into the system, it is very easy to exploit, and you could gain high privileges, say root or administrator. So just because there are more eyes on the code, does that mean it's safer? Well, it seems like there's not always enough reviewers. I think that is a bit of a downside at the moment with open source. They could do with more code reviews. 
and perhaps it would pick up more of these vulnerabilities. But of course, every time these vulnerabilities we picked up, they would end up in the press and go, oh, you've had a vulnerability since however long it's been around because you can date it. On the other hand, with vulnerabilities in proprietary applications, you don't really know. As I mentioned, you've got the fact that that vulnerability with SMB version 1 could have been around since 1990, or maybe it was just a complete failure of someone to patch something in the year 2000 or something, Then it's been around for the last 17 years. And who knows? It's difficult to date. I think the only conclusion I can give you is all operating systems have problems. But certainly on Linux, the problems are less severe than, say, Windows or Apple. Well, thanks for watching. I'll see you all later.